out on the residency out here we've we've been quite engaged and mm. organizing i mean we're in a small town in massachusetts oh, right. i was wondering where you were yeah the top of cape cod where the pilgrims first arrived so it's called like the end of the world and this is the first arrival point um and so it's quite a um historically obviously violent but also then symbolic place um and there's the tower that the pilgrims built right in this small sort of seaside mm -hmm. town and we organized a rally at the weekend um down through walking through the center of this small seaside town and it was yeah bizarre being in a town of three thousand people away from your own communities and networks in the metropolis in which you'd usually have um people organizing ways to be a body on the ground or to be in occupations yeah so i'm at the fine arts work center right now which is, um uh a residency space for seven months i'm only here for two months but it's for seven months for artists and writers um to live and work in provincetown which is right yeah, a small town at the very top of cape, cape cod and i'm here collaborating with someone who's doing um a two-month residency Mm -hmm. so yeah we're working in well this gallery you can see behind me which is another room back there and we're putting on a show at the end of the month so All right. yeah so it's and, been... uh, and you were there this summer and then you came back yes yeah, so I this summer I was at a school called Skowhegan School um which is like a historic U.S. art school um where it only opens for nine weeks every summer and it's been going for about 75 years um and it's kind of like there's about 60 artists and about 10 to 20 faculty, 10 sort of faculty um, and visiting faculty that come and you kind of like build a community together in some way. Um, the infrastructure, the, all the infrastructure is there to live together, but you in some ways um, simultaneously make your work alongside exploring how to live together differently. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah, the director, sort of described it as creating a a wedge within the our everyday experience of living together and giving us a temporary like or a temporary experience of what it would mean to live together differently um and that experience in itself kind of being like unsustainable to do forever you know that's why it's sort of nine weeks it's full intensity but it gives you a different way in which to come back out and reflect on um ways in which you might make your work. And as like a social practitioner, like it just completely um, transformed the way that I think about how I want to make my work, which was really nice. And um, I became much more interested in the ways in which the whole school or the whole group was organized and then necessarily focus, staying in the studio and focusing on my work. But you have always been focused, you are focused on how how groups function. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that uh, it took you even further from what you were interested in already. Yeah, well, it took me further in the sense that um, my previous interest has always been in some way like through the lens of art making or film practice or theatre making or whatever way. And, and then this was a moment in which I was feeling extremely ambivalent around art making in general whilst out there and sort of trying to understand a relationship to, um, but for the first time experiencing that ambivalence in a healthier way, in a more way of sitting and going, oh, what, what is this actually asking me to do? Is it asking me to um, exit art making in general or is it asking me to expand what I understand as my own practice so that it can leave room for more engaged engaged work which might not sit within conventional spaces or go back towards a conventional space which my work with groups is often done you know I'll work with a group and then it'll often end up as a film or something and they'll go back into a space and in and in some ways that's sat a bit uneasy with me sometimes um, Why? I, um I just think not because that is inherently wrong and I will still do that, but just as my only form of output that like I started to work in schools as well over the last two years. And 
didn't produce any films or didn't necessarily produce a work that could be perceived from the outside as, oh, there's the project or something. And that felt very um, uh, generative and like important that there wasn't a uh, compact like representation to give back to an audience to like perceive the, mm -hmm. the work that went on in the group and that that work that went on in the group could remain in some ways like opaque and like half anonymous and like through that we um as a group and as people um, maintain some agency um and didn't give this whole image back to the world the idea of like that that whole image of a project or the whole image of the self being in in some ways can be quite violent um and how do you maintain um give something back through it's like mediated form and let the audience know that what they're witnessing is is something that's not necessarily what happened exactly you know so it sounds like you're talking about basically some kind of like you're reflecting on the medium being a, a, almost um a constraint or some form of uh, burden mm -hmm. is that I, how you felt or no i think i think um I think it being maybe those words, if that was the goal of the interaction, mm. um, more seeing it as reshifting my practice, which I think has been happening over the last couple of years, but being out in Skowhegan sort of re sort of confirmed this that the inherent and deeper part of my practice being the engagement itself, and that being where I sort of base my um, spiritual, conceptual, or um, uh, like devotion to the group or the practice. And then the idea of that being a film or whatever is something that comes after, or, or it might come through it, but I, I'm very aware that you're getting a, that that's always gonna be a partial view of something that was in the present moment an experiential um, and dynamic um, moment with a multitude of people. You know, I went after getting back from Skowhegan, I went to um, a group relations conference, which is, um, have you heard of them? No, but I can I can kind of project what that made. <laughs> yeah. um, so the group relations was uh, started after World War II in, um, as a form of uh, group psychology. Um, in the Tavistock Institute in London. Right. Um, and it was um, begun by a psychologist called Wilfred Bion, um, and it was used for soldiers with PTSD initially um, to um, to try and, and what the sort of goal of group relations is, um, is for a temporary organisation to develop over a few days or a couple of weeks, for people to come together that don't know each other to simultaneously try to engage in activities to build this temporary organization whilst reflecting on the subconscious processes that might be going on in the group as they do it. Um, and when I came back from Skowhegan, I attended one of these at the Tavistock Institute over four days. And we, as about a group of 50 people, built this sort of temporary organization whilst splitting off into small groups, coming back as large groups. And the seating is, is arranged into different like spirals, different ways in which power manifests itself across groups, across this whole institution, this building. Um, and I went in not as an artist at all, and it felt and just as someone who wanted to be in a group and like learn with community rather than make work about community. And it felt um, like an important reshift in my work. It feels, it might feel or look subtle from the outside, but it was kind of a, a deeper transition mm -hmm. on the inside in terms of- so, so you did that, so you did that this September? Yeah, yeah, I did it in, in between the two residencies, yeah. Yeah, and it was four days, it was intense, really intense. Um, and by the end of the, um, you go you go through such a range of emotions over those four days um and so many of the power dynamics that are underlying within all of our institutions and organizational um groups are allowed to come to the fore mm -hmm. um, 
sort of race, gender, ethnicity, um, identity, like geography of where people are from and the different histories that would be coming up within conversations on that. And these things all sort of came out. Um, and there's consultants there that sort of very performatively um, don't say anything. Um, and in some ways, <laughs> the group in some ways is stuck between this ambiguous, anxious testing of what the institution is um, because the institution is being very um, ambiguous and not giving you any rules. Like what happens, the, the anxiety of not being given a proper task. Um, and then, yeah, and by not being given that proper framework, you as a group see back some of your own dynamics that can can actually sometimes get hidden by like a task. Um, you know, and we're constantly involved in our institutions in um, productive task making together, which hides these often subconscious power dynamics, which then come out in all these other ways. But this form of group relations is that is, we're studying those dynamics first and foremost, um, which found like which felt like an interesting place to sit. Um, with my work because you you shifted your perspective instead of being the observer you were a, a participant yeah exactly and I used to be um I used to do a lot of the performance I used I started doing performances myself when I was in uni and then when I went to do my MA I shifted to become more of the observer and was making these making a series of films and I've gone back to sort of be I guess in between the two um and being involved in the workshops and being involved in the situations that I myself would seek to sort of set up or um work through and I'm that there's a sort of a a moment in which the thing that is set up would necessarily want to set that up regardless of, of if a film was made, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, you know, that yeah. like, that it has meaning in and of itself, first and foremost, as an experiential counter, as a, a way to develop community, as a way to work together, as a way for us to think differently. And then if film is part of that process, that's allowed to be discussed as one of the actors involved. And then as a form of like presentation or mediation of the, of the encounter but first and foremost it remains in the in the experience um and that's been a sort of shift in practice i think that's really profound in a way because you know i was just re-watching glossolalia mm -hmm. um, and actually thinking about i mean first of all you're an observer but you're present in the room but then cameras present in the room yet you seem to have been able to still allow a very genuine exchange, even with cameras, even with you behind cameras. It was pretty remarkable that these people were still able to just be very open and, and very present. But even, even in that case, do you think something was lost to the presence of cameras and to the presence of observer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting in relation to that film, because I think that film in some ways um, benefits from the observer tension, mm. for sure. Like, and, I, and I don't think I wouldn't um, ever like eschew that as a role. I think there's, there's, a, there's a place for that tension and the provocation of documentary cinema that... Um, produces and makes explicit the power dynamic between observer and subject and all of the complexities that that might entail. Um, and I still think there's a place for that. And the difference being that, and I don't think this happened in that work at all, but the, the importance obviously always being that in the history of documentary, these things have often been explicitly and on the ground violent, but we can still, I think, have that provocation without the actual engagement being violent, without the actual situation, but the actual situation being one full of care and full of um, 
dynamic responses and full of like critical engagement from both sides. And then we can still bring that to the, the screen and have the audience allowed to question that provocative tension. Um, and as a filmmaker, say, for example, in those moments, you have to, you know, be certain with yourself, with your own practice, that those were extremely um, uh, caring and empathic and in and communicative encounters, because they, that won't always come across on the screen, because people could go, oh, what was their relationship together? You know, what's this, what's the artist doing holding a camera in front of these people? Like, they won't have seen the off-screen conversations that followed that or before and after the footage. And so you have to remain quite confident in your own um, uh, community practice if you are to engage in those provocative tensions, you know, or leave them explicit in the work. Um, but I think that work like benefited from that because it was kind of about the violence of representation mm -hmm. in, in the workplace, you know, and that being um, something that, is where documentary cinema can like still operate, you know, and it, it can still repose those things. So no, I think that that was um, purposefully an observational documentary. The question could be then about having a set of tools, but then the tools that you develop are developed in the process, right, of creating that work. So. Mm. So it's not like you you have a set of tools and then you're deploying them for a specific purpose, but actually the tools are emerging from the work being done. So I just, I don't know, like, I wonder how you think about that. Um, I think, I guess probably in, in two um, ways I'd answer that is that um, I would always hope and increasingly do that increasingly through experience of now working with different groups always move um seek to remain open socially or culturally or politically to what might play out and that is something to allow the process to determine um i think that i've made mistakes before of coming in um with a predetermined um position on a subject or or wanting something to play out in a certain way to prove my point or or whatever you know and through experience I now have realized that's not when even the most interesting things happen or also the things that um need to be talked about you know if, if you're doing this work genuinely then that's where the work is within these social encounters and so those need to remain open to um, expand themselves, reveal themselves, be true to themselves, et cetera. Um, and so as an artist or um, filmmaker or whatever, that's the part that I will, I continue to seek to not project onto. Mm -hmm. um, and then on another side, the bit that I do um, try and determine or think through is the structure in which something exists. Um, so all of my films, including Glossal Island, have always been set in one room. Um, and in that sense, I guess I use the constraints of theatre. My filmmaking used the constraints of theatre to bring different groups into a single space um, to try and think through how architecture or a single room can host sort of a microcosm of different communities or different groups of people that might otherwise not exist together or see themselves next to each other or have dialogue with each other. Um, and as you saw in Glossolalia, you have a sort of like juxtaposition of predominantly two different groups working. Um, and had I shot them in their respective spaces so that there was a not the same theatrical backdrop or not the same room for each one, that relationship would have been very different. Um, and so the tactic that I that I use is um is architectural, really, I guess. Um it is thinking through spaces as I would say the sort of what I call like architecture is like my second camera, really. You know, it's like it's the it's the camera or the position of the filmmaker within it 
is still part of what I see as the wider framework, the infrastructure that's holding the film and potentially being the, a bit like the camera would be produce, producing a provocative tension and potentially like an emancipatory one, you know, and it's always playing between those two things. Um, and so, yeah, it, it moves across those two. I, I think through the, the structural framework of where the film and, the, and, and where we do the work, I think through that, what that can be, what that is, and then how the work plays out, I remain open to as much as possible. But then, but then you're saying that, let's say now, with your, let's say, residency in, in the US and the sense that you're building a, or being part of a community that's evolving and be building itself, mm -hmm. do you then, does your perspective change or does your, in a sense, are you an activist? At now, or like, are you? Can you be an activist in your work? Can you project uh, a sort of political point of view? Because what you're saying is that you're creating a structure, and that you simply have to remain open to what unfolds within that structure. But then you're saying that the structure itself is a creative act. It's a facilitation or or an artistic act. Mm -hmm. um, but then I guess if your perspective or your position changes, if you become a political, uh, I mean, I, I'm constantly having like kind of weird parallel thoughts because of course you can be political by how you stage the, uh, <laughs> the work, but can you also be a political actor within it? And what do you then as such how do you do that? How do you act politically? How are you an activist and facilitator at the same time? Do no, it's a, good, it's a good question. Yeah, I actually, I actually don't know. I don't have a clear answer in my work for that at the moment. I think that's going back to the ambivalence. It was part of the, um, the questioning of like how to find my desire to be a political actor in the world and to be an activist alongside an art practice which in some ways um feels can feel counter intuitive towards that because you are constantly coming up against questions of representation even if it's done in a sort of the most um that is sort of like rep classic representational way, you're still coming up against these questions of, of mediating it back as a project after the fact, you know, after the thing. And in that sense, that can undo, can often, but not always can undo a lot of the work that you might want to do as a political actor, if you're being genuine in the world in which you wouldn't necessarily want to um, be the person representing that or something. And there's obviously a multitude, like historically and present ways around that, like and what does it mean to be a political actor in that sense is obviously so open and isn't so expanded that it would be hard to like touch on it all but just from my own perspective that's probably where the ambivalence sits is in the question you're posing is is literally that how do i in a genuine way within my work maintain um maybe the openness is the political actor you know maybe that is where the politics is in the work and outside of my practice in doing forms of activism with community that aren't about art making at all which are forms of activism that can be more directed you know mm -hmm. and then just as a person which is i think where i got to over the summer is that oh not everything i do has to channel through the funnel of my practice through the funnel of art making and maybe that will leave um my practice more open to what it's genuinely trying to do if I don't try and funnel in certain political questions into it, which aren't necessarily meant to be there or being forced into it. Um, I don't know if that sort of makes sense. Yeah, it does. We started by discussing a very recent change that happened in your thinking about your work, but I wonder how you got to that work in the first place. I know you did a um, MA at, uh, at Goldsmiths um, 
did you come to it as a filmmaker or did you come to it as a sort of visually creative person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I did a BA in fine art, in painting, actually. I suspected that. Did you? <laughs> yeah. And I, um, but I didn't paint once, you know, I just like, I started, I got, as soon as I got there, my like world expanded in terms of seeing other practices that I just hadn't seen, obviously, throughout schooling, which is still something that I focus on in my work to try to make sure it's expanded for, for people. Um, and then I got there and I, um, yeah, produced a lot of like solo performance work. Um, and it was very much engaged in 60s, 70s performance artists um, and building installations and different things. And then when I left there, I had found like the conversations within art school, just like a little bit, this is generally speaking, but like a little bit limiting outside of like urgent challenges that might be like being faced environmentally, socially, politi politically, and found the like space of the crits just a little bit ambiguously placed around still like formal questions, which like are interesting to me. Um, I don't think I'm an artist that could stay. There's great artists that do it, but I don't think I could be one that stayed within the space of the formal but like sort of needed some um, real world encounter. And then we ask, okay, what are the like, what are the sort of formal or what engagements, what are the methods that can be used to intervene or apply to this? Should it be done? How can it be done? You know, et cetera. And I found that the art school I was in didn't necessarily have much space for that. And so then I decided to go and do one of these more multidisciplinary courses and go and study with research architecture and yeah, film kind of became a natural medium, I think, for myself as an artist there. There's a lot of architects and other people doing more research-based investigations. Um, but I think it was such, you know, as when you start an MA, it was such a mind-blowing experience in terms of new knowledge coming in and new encounters with things that the observatory position felt like one I just naturally went into. Um, and through that observatory, like, is observatory a word? Observ observatory position. Um, that's where I sort of, like, um, generated, still like to operate. I still think it's, like, an important place to operate, but a place that I don't think I could have gone any further. I don't think I could have done another position at that time in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. That's just so sort of how it works. Mm -hmm. So did you did you use film while you were just doing performances? Was film already oh, really. Good, or actually it really came after? Yeah, so Glossolalia was like my first film really. I'd made one just before then that was like a uh, installation you one with mm -hmm. three actors in a theater. Um and but that was really my first like engagement with film. I was really like learning on that job. That was like a one of those ones where you um really just have to like I remember like researching the night before you know like how to do correct exposure and how to <laughs> do like get the aperture right and white balance and all of these things you know just trying to like really understand but you captured sound really well in, in yeah I hung mics so I like hung mics across the stage you know so it was like um and just had one radio mic on the teacher um but yeah, again, these things were I, the, actually the second film, I, the film I made after that, I made more technical errors in that than I did in that one um, because that was shot in a huge warehouse and the audio was all a bit off. And so I learned a huge lesson. Whereas in that one, um, the theatrical room with the dampening of the curtains and stuff managed to keep the audio a little bit kept in. So that was good. But um, no, these were the first times I worked with film, really, other than little bits and bobs in like a more sort of artist way. Yeah. Yeah. This is But did you did you have love for film or was that part of the knowledge that you had to accumulate and discover? No, I don't think like I don't think I have like a love for film. Like I think my like um this is what I'm coming. My love is more for like um, working with people and like seeing people who do that and that's why I think that I went into the observation and film role as my like first way of engaging with these new forms of research 
Um, you must have seen you must have seen films that basically taught you that that that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Oh no, for sure. I was definitely no. I, I'm. I was definitely um, watching like a lineage of work, watching people that I enjoyed for sure. Um, but it's I'm not like a sort of like cinephile where I like need to watch films, but you know, and it's interesting as a filmmaker. Um, that's not where I go to necessarily for my like um my deep desire to watch things and so that's why I think my practice is now understanding the film as like one element um but yeah no I was obviously I mean it's hard to not be um interested in like the the whole like work of like Frocky or someone which lots of peers are and people you know and, and looking at these educational scenarios or these, or these spaces through that that lens and him like sort of remaining I mean I read recently um Erica Balsam's essay which was written in I think 2016 maybe so maybe a while ago called like the Re reality-based community I think um and she's arguing for a shift or highlighting the possibility of a shift back to observational documentary um in a world in which the images and the rhetoric that we face is constantly trying to delegitimize our sense of reality mm -hmm. and constantly trying to place us in an ambiguous space um since the early 2000s we had that documentary turn that tried to constantly situate itself between fact and fiction as in you're watching it and you don't know what's real or not and those questions like initially interested me but they really like they no longer do on in so many ways not because that's not an interesting place to operate but in two ways after reading <laughs> Erica Balsam's essay firstly politically because I actually think the idea of asserting a sense of reality in our work is important in the face of shifting image culture and shifting language culture um and secondly, because those questions are like kind of really old in a sense of like, oh, is this fact or fiction in documentary? Where's the sort of artifice? Um, and to if that artifice is going to be sat within, if we are going to sit within that threshold, what's the other question at stake? You know, like that can't be the place to stay. Um, and that's when, yeah, I started off in that space, but that felt like um I was learning a lot through doing but I didn't want to necessarily stay but what's there. interesting is that also you were learning through it but also your interest was in an educational space so in the space of learning mm -hmm. yeah I'm really interested in again I'm, I'm really interested in like my subject of research or whatever I'm looking at um being shown back to a viewer in its like state of mediation as it's mediated through people. So what we're witnessing is, is always a sort of simultaneous, a dual thing, both the subject itself and the way in which a subject operates and moves around a group, um, an institution, uh, how, and then we see it get held in different power dynamics, you know, and have different weights. And that feels like to me, the stance in which I like to make my work, which isn't like, here's my view of, a subject matter of, of um, this piece of research, either with a voiceover or something. And even if you keep that, you know, showing multiple sides, you're still potentially maybe speaking from a single voice, which can have the subconscious effect of a singularity, even if you're talking about multiplicity. Or if I was doing single interviews, one after the other, you're still sort of, you might get a multiplicity of them. Um, research, but you're still... Um, maybe not seeing these things within a group power dynamic mm -hmm. which you know you're seeing them operate as individual people in different spaces and so i'm interested in my work is like how does what's the power dynamic of the situation and the group in place and how does a subject and a piece of research move between that um and that's where my like real interest in, in working within like educational spaces as a filmmaker and artist operates, I think. And so the work itself is in that sense, it's very reflective. <laughs> it's like, 
But then as an artist, and this is always a big question for any, I guess, filmmaker, is how do you know what the audience will feel? Because you're almost in the business of knowing how audience will react. Even technically, when you, you know, like whether something is going to be on the screen for three seconds, that will completely, it will generate a different response, right? So in some way, you're like a totalitarian, but then on another hand, you're you're allowing this kind of multiplicity of, uh, of um, interpretations. So I don't know how you bring those two together. Yeah, no, I think that's been a lot of my... Um... Uh, part of the, part of the shift that I've had recently is that the previous way I was working or thinking about working was giving a lot of anxiety and that was down to the spaces like you've talked about the moment of distribution the moment of screening being a place that gave me deep deep anxiety that um the people in my films would be misperceived or that the project would be misperceived and I wouldn't have con control over that you know and that came from screening say the same film in different locations and being at those screenings and sometimes people laughing at a certain moment or sometimes people being really sad or like whatever and especially in in glossolalia there was a, be a couple of moments that the audience might laugh in some of the screenings which filled me with like um surprise and like oh no like that's not what was intended in any way but I didn't so know what you felt uncomfortable about. Yeah, yeah, massively. And I think I didn't know whether that came from the film being quite heavy in other ways and that being like a moment of release for the audience or whether the um, audience was, or also I don't know who the people laughing, laughing are or who have their own experiences and their own identities. So, you know, it's right. not at all a judgment back. It's just a reflection of what you're saying is in that moment makes me as a filmmaker anxious and I've become much more calm in that just through experience of showing and understanding it's going to be different. Um, but it's so important and something you don't have loads of control over. Um, in Glossolalia, I, I did feel it's it's an hour long, right? So I think it, it, it offers an opportunity for a viewer to adjust to to what you're trying to say i think in that sense i think i mean showing people that want to change in some way who they are for a particular reason or at least their accents but i i would say that you you could instantly judge so maybe the, the, there is like an instinct of being judgmental but then you actually allow them to speak and then you also i guess you then also offer different perspectives and you allow us to not just to necessarily understand where this comes from but also you kind of humanize them so then you allow us to see them as just people like us yeah i mean i guess that's what you're doing mm -hmm. you're allowing space around something to counter a potential prejudice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no i think that's yeah that's um that was my sort of best feedbacks from that work have been people who um um felt like that talked about something that they hadn't felt was talked about and they felt affected by so that was good but like it also it makes me remember that um the people that i was working with in that workshop quite a few of them went on to continue working with the teacher mm -hmm. after Kate. And I guess this is what I mean by um, where's the real work or where's the expanded practice, you know? Was it in the genuine engagements that happened regardless of a film and that continue long after the mm -hmm. project in ways that I wouldn't be able to fathom and that being do I can do I constitute that as part of an expanded practice not to name that back in as part of a project but just in how I think about mm -hmm. doing work and if I'm going to work in this way with um people or subjects of that nature then how can I think um by thinking about film as just one component allows me to make sure that I'm introducing foundations and space. And... So how do you do that? I don't remember what piece of work this was related to, but I did read as I was 
preparing that there was a piece of work. Part of the work is a lecture that would be given alongside the work. I think that that's that was um the like sort of sequel to Glossolalia, I guess, that um was an update of Haran Frocky's um the interview, nineteen ninety six, the interview, which was um and I restaged a storytelling class, storytelling class for entrepreneurs in a warehouse in in Leipzig, Germany. Um and yeah, as as part of a live event, I also had um one of the actors, one of the people in the film do a lecture um for me. As I used to do and still do like artist lectures where um people perform as me and I do the visuals and they and it's sort of about this relationship between the labor of speech and the disembodied voice and what that means to speak for someone else and so one of the and often I try and use the people in the projects um yeah and so she did that she she did a performance lecture alongside before the work was sort of installed which I see as part of the as part of that work for sure um that's that still is a sort of like that still for me stays within a certain realm I guess I was sort of also talking about the ways in which the shift for me has been to prioritize um, thinking about the relations from the start to the end from very early on, not just as um, as potentially sort of um, work feels like the wrong word but as part of the practice you know as part of what it means to be having a social practice if you're making film that like the the sending of the emails and having the zoom calls with people and then staying in touch and being seeing where people go after and that that being part of this very much an extended timeline that's kind of ongoing with social practice and like that um it doesn't sound like an obvious shift I think I've always conceptualized it like that it's a bit more of a deeper spiritual shift you know or sort of I, um and it's allowed me to um become much more calm about things not coming off you know maybe not getting access to an institution maybe like a certain um person doesn't want to work with me or doesn't have time for that film, and you know and that not being a like it might more have used to have been like a, oh damn like like you can't make that point. And now it's much more of a I situate my practice on a deeper level that understands that that was already part of what needs to be happening and that was the right decision for them and that was the right decision for us and um and it takes away this um it moves away from the sort of this relation is about me and getting this film done but that actually at the 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 base level where um the real work the work that needs to be done from a, a core place of presence is the 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 like discussion and the generating and the working together and if that's done with like an anticipation anticipation of wanting to represent something or wanting to get that out there or, you know these are the things that are um causing like micro violences in the world and, and causing like energy to shift mm -hmm. in unhealthy ways and so I guess that's what I mean that I've uh, the film is a component based in this sort of expanded understanding of mm -hmm. what I see as work which I'm never going to show that labor or those relations within any setting that someone's going to see and be like oh they had all these conversations with this institution or that place or whatever but that's just for my own sense of what it means to be um an artist working in the world I guess um it's making sure that those those things are coming from the right place you know are coming from the right place of of how do you um mm. especially when you work with institutions in which you might be slightly critical of or mm. wanting to like film inside of um that you're how do you balance that you know how do you balance um being genuine and um uh, faithful to the people on the ground, the labourers, the PR people, the mm -hmm. directors. The the day, they're all people as well. Yeah. And like, but what whilst wanting to, um, in some ways, 
um, maybe hold an, hold an institution accountable or something um, through our work. And these are all things that I've struggled with, but having an expanded view of the practice has allowed me to maybe deal with them mm-hmm. or hold them, I think is a nicer way, hold them in it. In, in, yeah, so an important part of your work is an interest in institutions. And actually, I'm very interested in institutions. And I just wonder where does this interest come from? And why, why, is, that, uh, why is that an important part of your work? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Why that's an I think um it comes back to um the frame, the architectural frame, um and the idea of the building or the room as some form of like limitation or obstruction to sort of um, I guess I'm interested in writers, say like Borges or people that in some ways the world is found within like a library or, you know, the, these different things or, and how actually being within a single room, you can find a microcosm mm-hmm. um, of existing power relations outside. And for some reason that felt like a space, uh, literally a physical space in which would give me some form of limitation on how to um look at things so instead of going out into the world and looking at different components being like oh what happens all within these these walls and i think you're not not interested in let's say abolishing institutions Mm -hmm. you acknowledge their existence as these spaces that are historically constructed and in some way as you previously said respond to these internal conversations and actions and tasks I don't I think I'm thinking about institutions in the like classical sense of like this top down, this sort of hierarchical, very concretized, hard to move hmm. set of relations. Um, I think that you could argue that it depends how we think about the word. Um, and for example, you could say that part of my practice, if you were, wanted to look at it in a Spanish sense, I would never use this word, but you could say like, oh, it's institution you're building into the temporary institutions or temporary organizations which maybe organizations is a nicer one it's you know (laughs) temporary organizations and this goes back to group relations you know you build a temporary organization um and what i'm interested in is not is using the organ the structure of the organization as a space to to that is that we can push back against that we can see ourselves reflected back against as we either attempt to build one or attempt to dismantle one or whatever whatever that takes place but the work the work my work my practice isn't necessarily you're right in an end goal of dismantling or Mm -hmm. reinforcing an existing organization or space but much more um allowing us what politics or um, group dynamics emerges in the threshold or the space as we seek to as it becomes destabilized or it becomes formed or it becomes slightly transformed or shifted um and i think that's where and that shift can be like really micro to to reveal quite a whole set of things you know and this this that's i think um something that art practice can do is is that intervention that other fields might not be able to do that also institutions um give license to artists to do that you know they can invite you or you could you can know if you get access and they they allow you to do some form of intervention which produces a little gap that allows us to see that institutional organization in a slightly new light right that like if you're working directly in the organization you don't often have the license to do you know um in the same way because art is given that role you know whether it's coming and that's in a whole history of art history and institutional critique in other forms um but like in terms of so that's where i think my practice operates is in those small shifts i think if we take the notion that andrea fraser Mm -hmm. institutional critique and the fact that there is no outside Mm -hmm. but what she says is that even if you're a grassroots organization or if you're a tate or if you're your three mates doing something that actually, as you've just described, you, you are still organizing in a hierarchical manner, etc. And in a sense, there is no outside. So again, like, I don't know, sorry to kind of 
keep going on this, but is there outside? Do you feel that there is outside? And then should there be outside? And hmm. um, I think there's by if we, if we like posit an outside, then obviously we're also positing an inside. And I think for different communities, especially vulnerable communities, that, that inside is really important um, and much more needed for different groups than maybe other, other groups in like, um, um, so I would like to think that that need for, you can never be fully out, so you can never fully obviously not have an outside but to create temporary spaces where there is an outside so that people can feel safe with an inside i think is um different politically is a different political necessity and should be a different political necessity for different groups of people that will need that space and need that as a safe space to organize and to not have that as a a porous encounter you know so i think that's first and foremost i think it's like um it's a different political question depending on which group we'd be talking to um in terms of um, my own work, I think that I'll answer it maybe in two ways. I think that um, one is more in my like staged films. Um, as I've said, I think I used to think there was an outside in the sense that this happened over two weeks and that was the work and everyone's just gone on off and done their own thing. And now I've realized this much more as I was talking about this much more expanded timeline um which i now feel like has allowed me to constitute um continuing to question and develop ways i can make my practice um uh more and more like healthy mm -hmm. and like um on both a personal and collective level um so you know i don't think there is an outside now on that even if they are staged situations um yes there's i think the the outside and the inside has different intensities you know, it's different if it was sort of mapped, there's core moments that has an intensity on the inside and then the outside, these things disperse off, but might find little awesome moments of intensity through an encounter of people maybe meeting that were involved in that experience or whatever. So I sort of see it as much more dispersed. On another thing, my practice, for example, working in other institutions, I've been over the last year, two years sort of doing a few work in schools and working with um, uh, teachers introducing performance practices into schools. And this is in the framework of the current schools crisis, you know, that's been going on um, due to like systemic underfunding for a long time. And um, I'm the outside then, you know, going in to this existing space and also working in Tate um, as a film can like, um, film technician and working in the conservation department um, with um, my friend, Jack McConkie. He's set up with other Tate colleagues. He set up something called Inherited Practices, which is a response to artworks that have been acquired by the Tate that have sought to, through that acquisition, disrupt the way or transform the way Tate conserves um, artworks in general. Um, and that's come specifically from work from black artists or indigenous artists that have refused to um, conform their work to um, the framework of a Western conservation, you know? And they said, actually, even if you can conserve this materially, you can't conserve this culturally, historically, through memory or other encounters because you don't have the tools, you don't have the language to understand this. Um, and in that sense, you're there still trying to conserve that or not? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that um, that um, that these things, the artwork. I mean, and this goes back to our question of distribution, but it does. So I might be going a bit of a tangent here, but this relates to the sort of inside outside. The idea that it as a sort of finished object or some form of object that's able to get acquired whether even if that's a digital file or performance or whatever it is can move through the the move through into a museum that to acquire has to know you know so the idea that the idea to care for something um which conservation is to, to care for it is to know it 
And that is a caring act. It really is a caring act. However, it's also not caring because to know is a violent thing, especially if it's known the wrong way or to know it or the act of knowing produces an absence or reifies an absence of something else that it can't know. And um, so, you know, in a museum, the can, the museum will release the money to the artist once the conservators can sign off that they know it. But what happens if the conserv if the artwork refuses to be known? You know, what happens if it refuses to be fully known? At what point then do you does the museum say that it knows it well enough to take care of it? Um, and this has been a lot of the chats and the um lot of the conversation I've had at Tate, like I was saying, and that's predominantly the work being done by conservators people like Jack McConkie and stuff in this inherited practices group. Um, and that's been an interesting way in which the outside and inside has taken place, yeah, I guess, in schools and in Tate. Um, yeah. Don't know if that answers your question, Mark. You know, that's a bit of a tangent in different yeah, ways. No, I mean, it, oh, of course it does. Uh, it is really, it's interesting to, to put those two, I guess, forms of practice in, 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 in perspective to one mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. uh, both both interestingly educational um, uh -huh. aspect of work so in some sense i wonder if you ever see, if you actually see yourself as an educator i think like that's primarily where i'm moving yeah mm -hmm. i think that that's like um something that uh i have the aspect of my work which is what i was maybe trying to get towards when i said about not being sort of a deep passion of film but like what the deep passion lies more in educator um and facilitator and being with and working with and creating projects with people um and that's why i think for example the schools project has done a lot of work there but there's not been any film or any mm -hmm. final thing to necessarily but perhaps there have been other other forms of documentation i mean in a way documentation of the work doesn't need to always end up on the wall <laughs> I don't know yeah. for sure. Documentation is also it can exist in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, and I think that that's when um, being an interesting um, question that I've had as an artist is um, what's the to not prioritize the need to always show back an encounter you know to um and this is what i sort of meant by i guess reflecting on work in schools or work at tate or going to group relations or like having these other things these things haven't in any way necessarily been um reflected back in a way that um could see a whole project in some cases they have but you know and in some cases they've been um if i wasn't an artist already that they're, they're not really about making art at all they're just <laughs> forms of engagement if that makes sense you know it's what well, i'm trying to get towards and like how do i balance that so so there is space there is a construction of space there's a construction of a series of, of relationships within that space do you do you like give instructions do you do you have a curriculum how do you see education basically i think this is a broad could be a broader question in my own work or in in general do you I think mean? um if you are working in this domain presumably mm -hmm. you're doing things the way you think that should be done i mean that's how i take my role of a teacher in mm -hmm. some sense i always feel like i teach the way i wish I was taught mm -hmm. um, but also the way I'm all constantly responding to other teachers so I guess the question is broader is mm -hmm. like if you are an educator what is the education that you believe in or, mm -hmm. or like what's what should the education be like mm -hmm. well yeah it's a good question I mean um I think the um my if i just speak to maybe i the best place to speak to and the most interesting for me would be the um workshops in schools 
Um, and in those spaces, um, I found that, hmm, how best to sort of frame this? Because again, it's quite a sort of broad question. I'm just trying to think of the sort of ways in which to articulate it. Um, you could give a concrete. You can give a concrete example if that's easy. Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, for example, I was working in a school in East London, and um, there, my primary way of teaching art in its expanded sense, you know, would be. Um, would be to, I guess this would be, yeah, would be is first to suggest that we are not just looking at or reenacting art history as a um, radical and disruptive and potentially radical and disruptive and interventionist form of being in the world, but we are actually living that. So, to do that would be that we are in the if we are to say um look at historic performance works or in some ways look at performance work looking at fluxes is like a boring like 14 year olds like one because the documentation is a bit boring often and two because it doesn't relate to their like specific cultural and political position of living in east london at that time necessarily um but what um, is potentially interesting is allow is as a teacher, facilitator, educator in that space to not um, prioritize um, obedience to the to the sort of cause um, to the lesson, because the very subject you're looking at is disobedience, and so um it would be counterintuitive for me to be trying to teach that through a lens of behavioral discipline yes obviously there's like you can't have a completely unruly classroom in which and if anyone's obviously being hurtful or uncaring to someone you know those things need to be addressed but generally speaking that those like teaching it would be to is to like live it is to live those things and that means allowing disruption and going back to the museum is not allowing the unknown you know as a teacher saying like or as a museum being like if the institution consistently tries to hold to only allow unknowns in the known you know so it's like okay we can allow this to happen within this frame this you know and we all know this with health and safety regulations and more bureaucracy, these things get lined out. We have to continually find space for things to happen that we might not know. And that might be, um, yes, that doesn't mean not producing a safe space, of course, but like producing a space in which the disobedience that you're actually talking about historically um, is real because, and it's, and it's lived. And we're in an institution where we'll always be often teaching, as you said before, if it's three people, if it's a group of people, if we're in a school, if we're in a museum, we're always in some form of organization or institution, which we might want to push back against, you know? And so I guess my primary way of teaching would be to simultaneously teach the subject itself and to leave space to push back and question the formations that we're finding ourselves in. I mean, that's almost also my ultimate goal is to, to almost uh, educate these disruptors, but somehow disruption and education are almost two completely opposite things. Mm -hmm. Education is this thing, it's like, I'm gonna teach you something. And then um, a young person thinks that they're gonna be taught the right thing, the right way. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then really, how do you build in, how do you create space for um, counter, for countering that, mm -hmm. um, I think it's 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 a sort of a key challenge. I occasionally have to tell my students, you know, you should you should disagree, or <laughs> but it's it's a bit like it's a thing that you shouldn't say, you know. It should just it should that thing should kind of emerge. No, I mean each group, yeah, it'd be very different on university level. The challenges are different in those spaces, you know, and it's responding to the 
to both. I think this is where my like inherent interest and my overall practice um, takes always performance as a gaze, you know, and performance studies as a gaze in which like in some ways <clears throat> um, we're all aware through performance theory now that we can all say we're all, everything's in some ways can be seen through performance. Um, mm. But what does it mean to like, if, as performance, if performance is actually doing, a doing thing, not necessarily um, a passive thing, how can we, we have to do those forms of um, change or transformation as a teacher, I guess, in which that gives, opens up new space, or even if that's like, you know, in, and then in different groups, that'll mean different things that are, a rigidity would be the thing that would cause disruption, whereas in other space, um, <clears throat> a more openness would cause <clears throat> the class or the students to come towards you and to, you know, and disruption's not, I don't just mean disruption as well. I also mean um, collective transformation or or shifting of things or, or space to feel like students can 